Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by MetLife. At MetLife, we believe in the value of advice, and that's why we're determined to support advisors with a life insurance experience that is sustainable, efficient, and unique. So, when the unexpected happens, we're there to provide care, compassion, support, and expertise for advisors and their clients when they need it most. MetLife. Life inspired by you. Hello and welcome to this part two of our five-part series on the new risk environment for income protection. As we settle into the changes from IDII, I'm your host Fraser Jack and in this episode our panel discusses the new mindset that advisors should adopt to move forward including the idea of having a house view or a clearly defined insurance philosophy. Let's dive straight into our conversation now. Welcome back to this episode where we are talking around the new world of uh, disability income insurance in the 2022 moving forward. There was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, one of the big things I think advisors have to think about in this particular space is the mindset and, you know, where do we where do we have our minds situated at the moment? You know, we've, we've got to get out of that negative mindset into a more of a positive mindset, uh, be able to help clients the best we can. Uh, one of those things that we talk about is an insurance philosophy or how do we specifically calculate how much cover or how we're going to start calculating with all the new products around. John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, we have had a view for a very, very long time that um, income protection is the core of um, the personal protection solution for clients uh, to create the, the amount of certainty. And obviously it goes from essentially most people need the income to support their lifestyle, okay? So, and obviously income protection is quite good because it covers for injuries and illnesses. So it kind of covers for both. And then we're building those covers around that, you know, the life insurance, TPD, trauma or critical illness cover um, and building those around those. I think with these changes that has come in, especially for the ones where we're looking at, you know, significant reductions in, you know, how much they can actually receive for income protection. Well, if that's the core, how is that then linking up to the other covers as well? And so this is where the mindset or the the, the, the way you think about the philosophy has been, uh, has changed. And, you know, as we're recording this in January, you know, I've actually had a lot of time to think about this and, you know, it still goes down to the default position of, of income of still the core solution and still working around. So I don't think that mindset has changed or the way that my philosophy has changed around that. It's really around, you know, the impacts on the, on the other covers. And one of the biggest impacts is we really need to be more granular and more detailed in regards to what exactly we're covering for. So it's not just a matter of having a, a rough sketch that's like, hey, this is what roughly you need it for, being real detailed on what it's needed for. And a lot of the risk specialists that are on here will say that's not news to them. But, you know, for a lot of the, say, general advisors or the, or the people that we, it, being specific on exactly what you're covering for is not only important when you're setting it up, but moving forward in regards to the reviews. And what I'm talking about is obviously the debt, the percentage of the income that's being replaced or the expenses that are being done, you know, final expenses, like literally getting as granular as you can across all three. Um, but also as well too, when you think about things like own occupation definitions on income protection and then reverting to any occupation, well, then the importance of having either a super link TPD and having an own occupation. And, you know, it's very, very important that they're all playing you know, a hand in the role of creating that certainty around. So, you know, let's just use a very simple one. Um, for example, if you've got a a provider that uh, was providing at 75% of, of income and now doing it at 70%, well, obviously that extra 5% of income loss, you know, that needs to be covered up in regards to the lump sum expenditure. So being able to just have that link, but then when you're going from any to own occupation, 
if you're not thinking about those super maximizers or those um, you know own occupation definitions in for, if, in regards to TPD, well, you could be in a situation where clients on claim for two years, the injury is made permanent. You know, where are we going with this? Okay, and so we just need to be really mindful that we're looking holistically at the scenario, and I think. We've been doing it for a while and I'd love for the other advisors who are on there here as well too is, is really having a stance of we are the professionals. And I think there was a period of time there where a lot of clients were coming saying, I want this cover, for example. And advisors fell into the routine of, okay, that's what the client wants. That's what I'm going to deliver. Now, we haven't been doing this, um, but it just reemphasizes the point right now it's nearly impossible for a client off the street to know all of this stuff, yeah? So we need to be making sure that we provide them with a full detailed analysis, but also with a philosophy and backing up of our understanding and also to explain to them the links of the covers and how they play for a personal protection plan for for, for, for that individual. And I think the rise of comparison sites, the, the rise of direct-to-market um, caused a lot of those issues, but as an industry to hold firm and say, hey, guys, we are the experts. And so there is, this is our comprehensive plan, okay? And also to understand that the changes that have come, particularly in income protection, okay, the changes that they have in regards to life, TPD, and trauma cover, and ensuring that from the get-go, you're giving your clients the absolute, a plan with the highest amount of claimability um, that you can for them. Yeah, now John, you're a, you're a holistic advisor, so you you know you're not just doing risk specialists, but you're also you know helping their clients through all the other aspects of their life. How much how much time are then you putting into them where the client may you know as you said, might have said, oh, I just want this, and you sort of, you sit them down and say, no, no, actually, we need to we need to drill down and we need to get detailed on this, and we've got to do a good job of it. Um, is that something that you're working with your clients then to say, no, no, you need to sit down, you need to listen to this, it's going to take some time, and we're going to get get to the bottom of it? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So really from the get-go, it's a matter of gathering all of the information right. Let's be honest. The the actual thing comes in right from the start to understand that regardless if if I'm doing goal-based financial advice, if I'm doing investment planning, risk specialist, whatever it is, I think the same common thing, and this is actually embedded in law, is knowing the client. And I think right now in 2022, it's getting that information. So from the get-go, we just tell our clients, listen, we need to know absolutely everything about you. We're going to be in a position where we know more about you than you know about you, So, especially around your finances. So for you to come in here today and say that I'm coming to see you because I want $500,000 of life in TPD, uh, that's all cool and well, but that's like you telling me that you want to have uh, open heart surgery because you've got some chest pain. Yeah, We really want to kind of set the scene from the get-go that we are the professionals and that we will come back to you with a detailed analysis based on what our recommendations are. Now, we will go through our philosophy, for example, a part of the onboarding process. So this is what our wealth creation framework looks like. This is what our personal protection framework looks like. And by the time when they're going on to then jump as a client, they're already buying into those philosophies. So we don't personally bring on any clients who want us as a transactional advisor. Um, and therefore, inherently, we're bringing on people who want to be coached through the philosophies. Yeah, it's a really interesting distinction, isn't it? Having a having a philosophy that this is what we stand for, this is how we operate. And therefore, when you when you step foot in here, this is what you get. Kathy, what are your thoughts? I definitely think, uh, just leading on from John, and it's something as a full-time risk specialist that I'm going back through and doing now is that philosophy, rewriting it, you know, if it's not written already, because I know in my practice, it's me and, and my boss, who's the other advisor. And between the two of us, most of this knowledge or philosophy is in our head. So if something happens to one of us or another advisor comes on and wants to explain our philosophy to a client, well, they don't know it because nothing's written. And that's, you know, we do it all the time. We're like, oh, I know, I don't need to write it down. Um, but getting it in writing so that you can say to the client, this is what we do, this is why we do it, this is, you know, the, the specific details that we look at for each of your covers and why, you know, it's important to cover all of these aspects. Um, it also translates very easily then across into when you do your advice piece because you've already got your philosophy there um, to put the advice piece 
together. John made a point about um, clients coming in and dictating what they want, and and we all have them. Um, and my first question is, is what's your understanding of why you want that figure? And I have some wonderful clients who are very articulate. I know what my mortgage is. This is what I want my insurance to cover. This is what my super will cover on that mortgage, and therefore the you know the property would be debt free to my um, independent children. In that instance, because they can clearly articulate what they want, it does make sense that that's an option for them. Does it necessarily mean I'm not going to look into the rest of their situation? No, but it shows to me that they do definitely have an understanding um, of what what they're asking for. Yeah, exactly right. I think uh, philosophy is you writing it down is such an important part, and then to be able to demonstrate it. Uh, and and I think philosophy, I love the word philosophy, it comes at basically your experience, right? It's everything that you've learned uh, along the way, and 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 created, and all the, your opinions uh, and mindsets along the way. So, Serena, yeah, I was going to comment that when I'm speaking with clients around what they need, and and yeah, you're right. We do all have people coming in thinking that that they've already predetermined the outcome is is to go back and think, okay, so what do they really need and, and what are they willing to trade off, um, you know, depending on where they're at in life stage and what lifestyle they're leading. Um, we do see quite a number of clients, for example, that have um, children at, at really quite expensive um, private schools and I like to understand from them, okay, so if something happens to you, are your children staying at that school? You know, do we need to find another $70,000 a year for how many years? And what we do then is go into those school websites, download the fees, really map it out alongside all of the other things so that you can say, well, what do we really want to happen? And for most people, they'd like their life to stay as similar as they can. So I normally would say to clients, we'd like to quarantine your basic reality of where you live and your support network and where your children go to school so that then, you know, some of the other things might might change, but but we've got that base um, that, that will be really, really similar. It also makes it far easier over time when we're looking to review those clients so that we can say, okay, well, how much older are your kids? Okay, we can take those school fees off. They've happened. You know, it's it's going to balance out over the longer term. It's quite fun, and I I would want clients to be detailed with us on those things. You know, like it it needs to work. I think um I think it's a really good point, uh, Serena. There, the, the trade offs that uh, that conversation with the client really allows them to take ownership for the decisions being made, or, or you know they they basically take that decision and say, oh, we've we've got. You know, that trade off conversation allows them to take ownership. Tell me about how much time you spend with your clients on that trade off conversations and how, how deep you go, because I think this is a really, uh, really important part of cementing the reasons why they have the cover. Oh, look, you really want people to understand that, you know, I, I'm not looking at my reality. I'm actually trying to understand their reality. And I want them to share with me what their life rhythm is, you know, how you, you can see from a family, like, do you want to continue working 60 hours a week if this happens or, or that happens? And explaining to them also that if one person gets ill out of mum and dad, potentially the other person's going to have to step back and look after them as well. Like when one person is sick, it doesn't just affect the sick person. And so I'm, I'm quite story-based when I'm dealing with clients. And, you know, I say to them, look, Who's taking out the bins? Who's going to school sports carnivals? Like, how are we going to make all of this work? And it's not going to be any easier if there's epic financial pressure. The other thing is discussing with them that their costs typically go up when they're sick. Um, as much as we have, uh, and I know it's been under pressure, but we do have a pretty amazing health system in Australia. If you want particular care at times, it's going to cost you money. Or if you want control over some of that care. So, we need not to be thinking, oh, that's all right, I'll just spend less because you're not going to spend less. Also, there's the psychology of when someone's sick that often they're like, "My, you know, they might be thinking to themselves, gosh, my day has been awful, let's all go out to lunch. So instead of having lunch at home that might cost the family $10, they're all going out and now it's 150 because they don't know how long that person's got or it's been traumatic. So it's all those small things and I think it's, 
primarily because like a lot of um, advisors, you know, you've lived a, a hundred claims with clients and you've watched this happen so many times. So I think clients like you to talk through that. It's amazing how claims can form part of your insurance philosophy. Yes. I think the, the one thing that myself and the MetLife team have looked at when we've gone into advisors' offices was will a customer who enters your office have the same experience in relation to assessment of insurance need regardless of the advisor or regardless of the paraplanner or regardless of the administration staff? So what we found is that if you don't have a consistent house view to ascertain the appropriate need for insurance, it actually becomes really difficult for the advisor to assess both the need and the affordability for each customer. Because what you're going to have is, and we, and again, the MetLife team have actually gone into various offices. And we've asked this question. We've gone to the paraplanners and we said, okay, calculate. So you have all the same information. So then a complete fact, find good, complete needs analysis. And we've gone to the paraplanners and say, okay, how much insurance does this person need? Then we've gone to the two or three financial planners or risk specialists in the office and asked the same question. And ironically, if there were five people in the office, so three, so two pair of planners and three advisors, we got five different answers. And what we realized was that there, you need to have a house view. What are the non-negotiables? So if a person's between the ages of 18 and 65, non-negotiable is always income protection. If a person has any debt whatsoever, then there's a non-negotiable that there will always be life insurance to pay off the debt. But then the question is, okay, we, we know this, now what else do we need? And making sure that there's a consistent philosophy there, what we found is that most people don't have it. Some people have rules of thumb, some people have various things, and the, inf- and the stuff that Kathy and Serena and John have mentioned, again, Kathy mentioned that it's in most risk people's heads, but they haven't articulated it. More importantly, they haven't communicated it to the other people in their offices. Um, the one thing that MetLife's doing right now is we're actually providing coaching for advisors and AFSLs to actually construct their house view to ensure consistency of the customer experience within the office. And the reason that we've done this is we said, okay, there's going to be some things that, as Serena said, you'll get to certain clients, you'll say, okay, we don't have a one size fits all. And we'll, we'll ask that particular question that says, if it's a yes, we go down this path. If it's a no, we go down the other. And it's almost like a tree diagram to get to those responses. But you, you ask it for every question. Once you get that consistency, then you start saying, okay, we now know the, the sums insured. We now know the types of product that we need. So whether it's going to be death or TPD or trauma or income protection. And we also know what additional benefits and features we're going to have for every client. And we know the process we're going to do to get there. If we don't do that, then again, if asset comes in and knocks on your door and they say, okay, Jeff, how did you get to this number? How did you get to this sum insured? And there have been advisors in the past to say, oh, we always give them a million dollars with life cover, or we always give them $500,000 with a TPD. If you haven't customized it to meet the specific needs of the clients, and it's a consistent process you go through, then you're going to breach your best interest duty. Yep, I absolutely agree. And I think uh, it's probably one of those things that we should be having a lot more conversation outwardly um, in groups of advisors around talking about it as well. Because, you know, the house view is one thing, but there probably should be an industry view or, you know, a, a collective of, you know, reasonings as to why we think this way. Because, I mean, I'm sure you'd see some massive variations and different levels of cover coming through from one advisor to the next. What are your thoughts, John? Just, you know, understanding the client, um, one thing, obviously being able to articulate, you know, how the covers have obviously come out, obviously the client to agree and not agree to them. But I think one of the biggest things that we can obviously use in 2022 is technology. You know, um, really, guys, it's around embracing technology. Now, we spoke, I think you spoke to Serena around how much time you talk about the trade-offs and stuff like that. Um, Remember, everyone, that this is a repeat conversation that you're having. Um, and usually where there's repeat conversations, there's technology like videos and stuff that you can send them, educational content. Like when we're talking about onboarding clients or even our existing clients when they're coming up for review, there's nothing stopping us by then just going, hey, listen, watch this quick video that I've recorded about how I calculate the insurances. Like um A lot of other industries are doing it, and I think the advice industry is now really ramping up in this area. It's around using technology as well, too, so um, to to show this. And what we do as a simple kind of add-on is, 
you know, we talk about like probably a little bit more technical than probably should. I like the word just trade-offs. Um, we use around disposable assets and stuff like that as well too, just like what would you dispose of? And, you know, it's very interesting. And, and what I'm looking at when I send like this question sheet to them for them to kind of get back, which is like a jot form, I'm looking for like indiscrepancies actually. So I'm actually looking at like, oh, I would sell everything. And so, and then I'll just talk about that point. I'll be like, okay, let's talk about, you know, you'll sell down everything. So you're literally going to get rid of all of your passive income streams from all of your investment properties, your this, your that. And they're like, oh yeah, I didn't quite think about that. And it just jots this kind of deepening into the philosophy that you've been speaking about. And usually after doing that maybe two or three times, So let's say by year two or year three, they're not questioning why you're reviewing their cover. They've increased their debt level. So you need to increase their covers or whatever it is. They're kind of indoctrinated in your process and your philosophy. So it's really about, for us anyway, about getting clients who believe in a certain way that I would hope that even if ASIC kind of knocked on their door, they could at least from a very basic level go, no, I understand why I've got life insurance, TPD, trauma and cover and income protection. So, John, just on that, you're talking about sending a video out to someone to gauge their understanding of a concept. Now, it sounds like you're asking them to do follow-up questions so you gauged whether they've understood. Is that? Yep. So, I'll just quickly run through it. Just We'll just do a little bit of a dummy run just for... for, for... Hey, Kathy, thanks for jumping on. Um, uh, jumping on. Uh, what we've got is a bit of a question set that we've got at the below this video. Just what I want you to go get you to have an understanding of is, you know, how we calculate our certain types of covers, you know, life insurance, DPD, blah, 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 and what we believe in X, Y, Z. Okay. So we're really just giving them a reminder. Now, if people aren't good on videos, they can obviously just link a, a PDF sheet or a, a house view like Jeff's talking about where you just kind of saying to them, Hey, this is what we do. Yeah. And a follow up after you reading this content is I just want you to fill in these questions for me. Now think about from a holistic point of view, this is very, very similar to a risk profile that we did over and over and over and over and again in the insurance game. You know, back in the day, we used to sit there, do a needs analysis with the client pretty much for an hour. Yeah. It's just around how can we, how can we use technology to get repeat conversations going? Okay but then have deeper conversations. Like, so when that question came up where the client's going, I'm going to liquidate everything, yeah, and live out of a tin box, rather than spending an hour on the repeat stuff, I'm spending half an hour on deepening the conversation, going into potentially like Serena is around trade-offs and stuff like that. Yeah, I suppose uh, just the clarification um, for other people that, sending the information to the client may not be enough to show that the client's understood it. So you've gone that step further to make sure that you're doing something after that video to show that the client actually responded to you in some way. So I think just making sure that if you are going to use the technology, right, to have that second step to show that the clients either acknowledge that they've listened to it, read it, signed it, watched it or whatever, or having those follow-up questions because I think there'll be a lot of people who go, yeah, let's do technology, let's send this video, let's send out this flyer, let's, you know, hopefully not post this letter. Um, But what they're not doing is that second step, which is showing that the client has actually actioned what we've said to them because I know that there'll be instances that people will say, well, you can't prove that the client actually understood because you've got no information back from the client to show that they have actioned what you've done. So I think that's just where I was getting to with John's point in terms of using technology is to make sure that there's that um, second point of contact with that client responding. Yep. I think there's definitely uh, technology is a great thing to be used and I think uh, we can use it a lot in the, the preparation as well uh, prior to speaking to the client and giving them the understanding that there's going to be a fairly in-depth conversation and some of the answers for those that conversation is going to be fairly important to how these things turn out in the past. 
Jeff, I was really interested in what you said um, about some of that work that you're doing with uh, advice practices around their house view and understanding, you know, and 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 being able to develop and document and write down what their philosophy is and um, and their process around, you know, talking to the client and having those trade offs. Um, I think what I really well, what I really want to try and focus on here is like w- with the mindset. How do we how do we send advisors out there into into twenty twenty two? You know, being excited about the 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 new products that are there and being excited about how they can help their clients. You know, in the in this new world. Uh, I think there's two things with that, Fraser. Uh, the the first thing is that the Institute of Actuaries of Australia in July 2021 actually looked at the products that were going to be out there based on the reference product for individual disability income insurance that they produced. And they said, based on that product, which effectively was the blueprint for many products in the marketplace now, they said, based on that product, we still have in Australia, we still have the best income protection product in the world. So when we look at what's in the UK, in the US, my country of birth in Canada, look in South Africa, um, in most of the Western world, when we look at the income protection products, the ones we have in Australia are still the best features, the best definitions, the best options in the world. So for me, that's still exciting. We're still providing world-class products to our clients in Australia, which I think that's exciting about. The other thing that I get excited about is that there was a Hilda survey that came out that basically said that 45% of Australians are financially illiterate, which means there is a there's an underlying need for the services that we provide as financial advisors, as risk specialists, as insurance providers to make sure that these people get their affairs in order. So knowing that we have the best products in the, in, in the world and that there's an inherent need to provide the education, support, and advice to these clients, it gets me excited. Well, wow, fantastic. Uh, John? Yeah, I think, I think one thing has been a bit of a, uh, an eye-opener for us is, is around just having a bit more of an understanding about what we actually do. And I know that sounds a bit strange, but we're no longer – money managers or just do money management. We've got a big basis on coaching people to these plans. And so when you think about someone that you've got come in, you might have two or three meetings, whatever your process is, you've probably seen these people for a maximum of say three, four hours before they're going off and taking these financial products, okay? We need to be improving that financial literacy. Like obviously on the investment side, it goes without saying, you know, but even in the personal protection space, like really just trying to improve that financial literacy. And it's really exciting for me where I get to a point with a client where we've provided the literacy, like the the education and they're just like, yeah, I get it, John. I know why we're increasing or I know why we're decreasing or like that is awesome because we can kind of just push that to the side, get deeper into another conversation and keep going. So I'm really excited around that. And I think, um, yeah, it's really a passion of of, of mine. Um, really trying to improve that financial literacy number. Yeah, amazing. And uh, tell me about the process itself. You know, we, let's talk about how long it takes to get through. You know, a, a client at the moment. I'm I'm keen to hear all your thoughts here. Uh, how long does it take from uh, from go to woe to these days with a with a with a you know a risk specialist client? I'll I'll take this one. I'm doing it every day. Uh, this is how long's a piece of string. Because I'd love to tell my clients, you know what, we can do this, we can research everything, we can get you the right product, we can put an advice document together and we can do an application and maximum that's going to take me four weeks, right? Because they're not my only client that I'll be dealing with, right? Um, There'll be multiple requests for information from the client, from probably a super company, potentially other insurance providers if they've got current cover and then you might throw in you know the health of the client right which you know that's a pre-assessment underwriting so there are so many factors that are not actually in our control in terms of how long this process is going to take Um, I can't even nut down sometimes to a client how many exact times I'm going to need to contact them about things because they'll come back to me with, oh, yeah, Kathy, I went to the doctors the other day and the doctor told me blah 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 And I'm like, right, so the entire four hours that I did researching products and doing pre-assessments, the pre- 
previous week is now, yeah, as Serena said, been and gone. You know, I am restarting from scratch. So, yeah, I say to clients, I will do this as efficiently as possible. However, this journey goes as quickly as you contribute to it, I said, because it's not just me doing it. Does that have hours attached to it? I'd love to tell you exactly how many hours it takes me, but there's not. I don't think there's any definite answer to that because it depends on the client. I would have to say that the uh, the assumption or uh, around from a lot of clients, Serena, on this one, um, a lot of clients would just have the assumption that it's easy, right? Oh yeah, people do think that. Unfortunately, yeah, it it all is around the pre work, and and that's to make sure that that the work you're doing is actually spot on. So you you can't be cutting corners and, and making assumptions around eligible service dates if you're intending to hold cover via super. You know, those are the sorts of things you have to check in on. People at times have three or four different super funds and then it's like, well, do they have cover in those funds as well? What are the, the dates attached to those? Are we going to keep those? You know, let's pretend they've got a heart condition. Well, yes, we're going to keep them. All of those different things you need to work together. And and I also like people to feel, you know, this is actually about them. You know, when I'm meeting with people, I, I really want to know them and talk to them. It's not a it's not a conveyor belt. It's not I'm just banging them through. This is this is special. And it I, I want to make it fun. So I'm normally really excited about my work and people find me nerdy and annoying and that's fine. Um, but I think clients appreciate the fact that you're excited about this and, and that you want to get it right. You're not, you're not there to just flick it through. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a very important part of the process to walk into the meeting and walk in, um, you know, to those client conversations, being nerdy and excited and, and, and excited about being able to solve the, the issues that are um, in front of you, John. There's nothing wrong with being nerdy and excited, trust me. <laughs> that, that's it. I think, I, I think there needs to be, like, it's, it's around setting the expectation around everything kind of really good and quality takes time um, and that goes without saying like you know when we're talking about doing things properly and we're talking about eligible service dates for example that takes time to find that information and get that right but I think there's another bit as well too is we also need to appreciate that I'm not going to say that they don't care at all but their care factor in regards to I need this stuff is at a pretty low level to start with yeah um, so it's a matter of, well, do I really need this stuff? Okay, I know I kind of need it. Let's get it done. And, oh, it's going to take me this long. It just, it, it is a bit of a painful process for the client because we're not talking about, you know, the sexy stuff. Um, in most cases, we're talking about the morbid stuff. But I think is once again, working side by side with technology to try and improve this area is going to be a big one, which we're going to, you know, potentially talk about the future of this, uh, future of this later on. But, that's going to be one. I think the other one is is that there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to protection. There's a lot of contributing people. So we're talking about, you know, us and the client, for example, but potentially we're also talking about the superannuation provider as well too, which is holding cover as well too. Are we talking about the doctor who's holding particular information that we've got? Is it the physio? And so it, it, one of the biggest things that I think as a profession we need to think about is how can we work with government to make it easier to collect the information that we need to make our job more efficient and more affordable moving forward. Similar to, for example, us screaming about about having an ATO portal where we're able to see certain information, being able to see certain information that will make our job much easier to make it more affordable and more efficient for all Australians. And because at the moment, I can tell you that the biggest holdup in our process is personal protection. Yep. Okay. And, and I would echo that, John. It, it, sorry, I was going to say it is, it is that admin side of things. I'm sure that's where you were heading with that. Yep. Yeah, Serena, exactly. And it's like even on the implementation side, which we're talking about like a little bit later in the step, even like post the advice, it's just a matter of 
things just taking so long, like so long, and it's holding up things. Like, let's be honest, you know, when we're talking about potentially rolling over from one super fund to another, we want to be making sure that the new insurances are accepted, accepted at standard rates. We're not going to, you know, inferior cover. So then it's holding up potential rollovers, which are holding up potential other strategies. And then something that, you know, realistically should take maybe four to six weeks, sometimes blows out to four to six months, you know, and, um, and let's be honest, COVID hasn't helped. You know, we we're talking around doctor's urgency on getting back a doctor's report. Yeah. All right. Very good. We might uh, we might wrap this one up, but before we do, I just want uh, I want any quick tips. I want you to go around the grounds and let's have some quick tips on uh, you know what, what tips would you give to advisors that are you know around their mindsets moving uh, moving forward as we go into twenty twenty two. Their mindset that they should be bringing into their uh, meetings with their clients. Uh, Kathy, let's start with you. What tips would you give to advisors? I think uh, get your guidelines sorted. I think go back, you know, reassess exactly how you're going to treat every single client that comes into your office because once you've got that set, you then know what you need to ask your client, how they're going to be treated and how to explain it to them. If you're coming into this year with new products um, and not having a good understanding of, how you're going to implement that and how that affects your guidelines, then you're not going to be able to articulate that to your client. And I think that is probably the, my biggest one for this year. Yep. Serena? I would echo what Kathy's saying and I would, I would comment that having that very smooth process so that you as the professional, you know, clients are coming to see you for your help and so you need to be the, the calm conductor. Um, and I think a lot of us who have done this for a while, we forget what it feels like to step into someone else's office and be sharing an enormous amount of personal information. So if you can have that as smooth as possible so that then you actually have lots of reserves in yourself to show up to be excited for um, the good bits or to, to work with them when they're upset, all of those different things, and to know that what you're doing is actually really, really special. Um, you know, this part of the job is actually really hard and it's a very thankless task because people actually, no one thinks they're going to claim. And and I say to clients, I don't know which which ones of you I'm going to be seeing again and when, in what way, um, but you know what an enormous difference you can make to people's lives. Yep. John? Biggest one is having confidence that you are the expert in the room. So similar to what Serena's saying, I think that clients – especially in an age of technology uh, where there's just so much information around. Um, you need to back your knowledge, back your experience, back your technical training, build a philosophy that sits behind that. I find that a lot of us are working harder and not smarter. And you've probably heard me trickle breadcrumbs through this around technology. Yeah, We need to start embracing technology to continue to provide affordable advice to Australians and deepening the conversation because that's not going to change, knowing our clients and knowing them intricately. Um, so really trying to look at your process and understand where you can deepen the conversation through technology to improve the quality of your advice being delivered. Wow, fantastic. Great, uh, great words of wisdom there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in this episode. Uh, jump into the next episode where we start talking about the uh, – get, get, get a bit more technical about the, the, the products themselves. Uh, this particular one's been around the advisor mindset. Really appreciate everybody's input, and we look forward to catching the next episode. While care has been taken in preparing this material, MetLife Insurance Limited does not warrant or represent that the information, opinions or conclusions contained in this presentation are accurate. The information provided is general information only and is current at the time of production. To the extent permitted by law, MetLife does not accept any responsibility or liability arising from your use of this information. The information about MetLife Life Insurance is general only and does not take into account your personal situation, needs or objectives. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice and should not be relied upon as such. MetLife recommends that you obtain independent and specific advice from appropriate professionals before implementing a financial strategy, including reading any relevant product disclosure statements and terms and conditions. Before deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold any of our products, please read the PDS available at metlife.com.au. And for the class of consumers who the products are likely to be suitable for and any conditions around how the product can be distributed, please read the target market determinations for the products available at metlife.com.au as prepared by MetLife and Equity Trustees Super Superannuation Limited. 
Life insurance products are issued by MetLife Insurance Limited, ABN 75004274882, AFSL 238096, and Equity Trustee Superannuation Limited, ABN 50055641757, AFSL 229757. 